will always support the creation of strong, thriving, and healthy American families. We want to make it easier for mothers and families to have babies, not harder. That includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America. Like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republicans, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans. What's going on, everybody? If you're here today, that means you survived the solar eclipse. So congratulations. We're going to talk about Trump's $50 million donation night. He pulled in over $50 million in one night at one dinner. The reason I want to talk about it is because if you watch the actions and not the words of a politician, you could usually be a couple of years ahead of schedule on what they're going to do. And if that much money is pouring into Trump's campaign, it's worth noting who is donating to Trump. I have a few people and also which politicians were there. It's pretty interesting stuff. Give me a thumbs up in the chat if you're here. And then after that, I'm going to do a live reaction to Trump's controversial abortion take. I haven't seen it yet. It's a four minute video. So I'm just going to play it after we talk about this stuff and do a live reaction. And also let me know what you think about that. Thumbs up in the chat. I had minor technical difficulties launching this one. So I hope I'm live on Rumble, Facebook and YouTube. Give me a heads up and Dream Rare Podcast starts now. It's the Dream Rare Podcast. Welcome to the show. The way to get the news at the desk or on the road. Let's go. God is great and success in our control. The world is crazy, but we get better from obstacles. Yeah. What's going on, everybody? Looks like we're live on Facebook. We got Eddie, Gloria, Mindy on Facebook. We got Luciana, Nicole, Bill Jana. The eclipse is happening now. Well, thanks for being here. Special eclipse edition. Yeah, I tried to look at the sun without the special glasses and it just blinded me. And I was like, I guess the eclipse is not for everyone. And, I, you know, I guess that was my sign from God that I should probably just stop staring at the sun without special glasses. I'm not in a position where it's a full eclipse anyway. So, yep. Thank you, guys. Someone said the sun is gone. We can talk about the eclipse afterwards, but um, I do want to say this before i show you some stuff about the donations um you know when it comes to being ahead of the curve on certain topics i think there's some content creators and some users that will try to elevate themselves and tell them that they know something so special or they're so much better than you where i try to do the opposite and say you know you could be a couple of years ahead of the pandemic you could be ahead of mandatory vaccinations you could be ahead of a lot of like the speech laws that are now being talked about uh, five years after they got passed. And it's not because I'm so special or you're so special. It's just follow the actions and not the words. In basketball, I'm going to use a quick analogy before I play the clip. They always say a lot of coaches were like, watch the ball, because if you watch like a head fake or they could, you think they're doing that. But if you look at the ball, the ball's either going to go in the basket, it's going to be passed or dribbled. So that's instructions that a coach gives like, Look at the ball and then you won't get faked out as much. It's like politics. And I want to say this, whether you're left wing or right wing, whether you love Trump or you don't like Trump, hating Trump and obsessing over Trump is the same game because people are running circles around him, his personality, what he's saying. They're not looking at the hundreds of millions of dollars of donations. They're not looking at his cabinet, whether it's Trump or Biden. If you want to know how their presidency and I made this mistake for a couple of years you know, kind of falling for a lot of the media tricks in a sense and being like, oh, this, that, they're saying this. It's like, who's the cabinet, right? Who's at the secretary of treasury? Why are they there? Who runs transportation? Why are they even qualified? Who's in control of foreign policy? The person that's the secretary of state. So, or secretary of defense, I guess, has some role in it. Anyway, you know, if you want to know how the presidency is going to go, don't listen to their words and what they promise. Look at who they hire. And when things go weird, no matter which president it is, and you're like, wait, why would they do that? A lot of influencers or, or content creators or political analysts or wh whoever, I don't know, podcasters, whatever you want to call people, they don't want to admit that this is happening. They'll be like, no, I like this person. So they would never do. It's like, that's what they're doing, though. They're taking money and they're selling their cabinet out to the people who pay them, you know, and Trump is really no different. Uh, you know, I think he does some things excellent, but the point I'm trying to make here is you could be ahead of the curve just by paying attention to this stuff and not being apparently as dumb or foolish as everyone else is and never learning from our past mistakes. So let me just show you real quick, you know, Trump raised $50 million and I saw a lot of people on Twitter, right-wingers that like Trump, they're like, he raised $50 million. He broke records. This is amazing. 
left wingers crying, false paradigm. You know, people are fighting. My thought was like, who did he raise money from? Who paid him? Who was there? Who hosted it? That will tell me the direction that Trump is likely to go. And I'm going to weigh in before we get into the other clip, you know, how Trump could kind of play these donors too, because he has more leverage, I think, than he had last time. So here's the articles, you know, Trump campaign says it raised more than $50 million at a Saturday fundraiser. You know, it was held in Atlanta, a high dollar fundraiser. So that, that's the news articles. I looked into it a little bit and it was at the home of billionaire Paul John Paulson. I almost said Paul Johnson, but it's John Paulson and Woody Johnson was there among Harold Han, Pepe Fan, who there's other names there. But so I was like, who's John Paulson? You know, he's the host of the fundraiser. He gave Harvard four hundred million dollars. That's a lot of money for a school of engineering and sciences. He gave NYU a $100 million donation, kept it secret for 10 years. I mean, that's on him. I don't care. I'm just saying it's $500 million to Ivy League schools. He gave $27 million to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem re recently. That was in the news all over the place. And also he gave $15 million to Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Uh, so, And then he also gave, you'll see in a second, $100 million to Central Park. So this guy has a lot of money going around, giving half a billion dollars to Ivy League schools, $100 million to Central Park, tens of millions of dollars to schools and art places in Israel. And uh, he made his money. I looked it up because I was like, how do you get so much money? It's just interesting. His prominence and fortune were made in 2007 when he earned almost $4 billion and was transformed from an obscure money manager into a financial legend by using credit default swaps to effectively bet against the U.S. subprime mortgage lending market. So I guess when there was a mortgage lending market crash, he bet against it, and that's when he made his fortune around 2010. Uh, it's just all interesting. So I was like, okay, this guy gives hundreds of millions of dollars to Ivy League schools that are super left wing, gives a lot of money to Israel causes and stuff over there. Interesting. The other guy, I think his name was, was it Woody Johnson? Or I, I forget the exact name, but I looked him up and he's the heir of the Johnson and Johnson family. If you guys don't know Johnson and John Johnson, excuse me, they're famous for a lot of things. They make a lot of products in America. Recently, they made the double pumpy, you know, I wouldn't say mRNA vaccine because it wasn't mRNA, but it was the one that wasn't that got pulled off the market. And Trump was always defending that Johnson and Johnson shot. A lot of people were like, oh, he's got a secret plan where that's the one that's not as bad. And it's like, it definitely could be that. But also, he gets a lot of money from the Johnson & Johnson family. So Trump's loyalty lies to the people who give him money. Even, I forgot to include it there, he's floated the idea of this John Paulson guy who hosted the fundraiser. Trump has floated the idea to give him a position in his cabinet. You know, And I, I don't think that Trump would have just gave this guy a position in his cabinet if he gave zero dollars. but raise millions or tens of millions or potentially hundreds of millions of dollars for Donald Trump, he'll give you a position in his cabinet. We saw that. It's not that hard to buy out Trump. Uh, I, he got like a million dollar donation from Pfizer. And then he went from a vaccine skeptic to somebody who put two pharmaceutical people in at the head of HHS and FDA. And, uh, you know, I'll get into that a little later, but let's look at some other stuff. Who else was at the fundraiser? One name, I mean, Robert Mercer was there. He's a big right wing donor, but one guy, Scott Besant, was an interesting name because I was like, who is that? I, I was just doing a lot of research on this stuff. And he actually used to be a high-level person with George Soros. I'll show you that in a second. So Scott Besant, an investor. Besant was previously the chief investment officer of Soros Fund Management, the $30 billion family office of billionaire George Soros. Uh, we'll look a little bit further. I saw an article that said the George Soros partner who disrupted right wing publishing, All Seasons Press, founded by billionaire investor Scott Besant, has a funny habit of signing big name MAGA authors to book contracts, then suing them. I read that article is pretty boring, but I just thought that that was interesting. So another guy there was a former high level employee who used to work for George Soros. This is why I laugh when I watch DeSantis and Trump supporters kind of just like badmouth each other constantly. They're like, oh, the, you know, the, the, the DeSantis is working with the Soros guy. It's like Trump took a hundred a multi-million dollar loan. I think it was like $140 million from Soros. He's literally at donor meetings now with Sor big big wigs that used to work for Soros. I'm not saying to not call it out in the DeSantis camp, but 
that's when I realized that the right wing was really unserious because between the DeSantis camp and the Trump supporters, it wasn't the fact that people disagreed, like pick your favorite candidate. That makes total sense. I don't care. But how people were disagreeing, I was like, man, this is crazy because I'm not that old for politics. Maybe I'm old for like, I don't know, obviously like college sports, you know, you got to be in your 20s. But like for politics, I'm pretty young. Um, everybody acts like such a child. It's so weird to me. Like, of course, you know, everybody has a little bit of like childish energy in them. You could be petty. You can, you know, throw a fit sometimes or get angry. Like nobody's like fully grown up. It's not like grown ups ever make mistakes. But what I realized just being in politics is like, man, people really don't grow up. And there's so much like high school mean girls energy where, you know, people will accuse DeSantis camp of doing something that Trump also does. But then they'll never mention that Trump does it also because they they like Trump or in the case of Vivek Ramaswamy, he always pointed out because he was trying to suck up to Trump, the billionaire pharmaceutical guy who cried on January 6th. Now he pretends like he's ultra mag or whatever. You know, he he would always be like, look at DeSantis passed these hate speech laws in Florida. And he actually started raising awareness to these laws that I've been talking about for years, which is cool. But he'd never mentioned that Trump also did the same through executive order because, you know, Vivek needs Trump and Trump was running against DeSantis. So you badmouth DeSantis to get in Trump's good graces. That's what Vivek did. It's smart networking wise, but I'm just being honest. It's like that's not really genuine. If you really cared about the speech laws, then you would have talked about them and said that Trump did them too, but you're only weaponizing them against DeSantis because you need Trump in your good graces. And I noticed that with uh, even the DeSantis crowd, like people like Dave Rubin, who was behind DeSantis, he started talking about Operation Warp Speed and all of Trump's pharmaceutical fa failures. Did Dave Rubin talk about that before DeSantis ran? It seemed like nobody in the DeSantis camp ever seemed to care about that stuff in 2020, 2021, and most of 2022 until DeSantis ran against Trump and used it as his campaign strategy. And then all these right wing influencers all of a sudden are like, oh, Operation Warp Speed. It's like, yeah, but that was what it was in 2020 and 2021 too. Like, did you say anything about it then? No, because at that time it was good for networking for them to be on Trump's good graces. But when they thought that DeSantis was the side to be on, then all of a sudden, so I'm just sitting here, even during the Trump and DeSantis stuff, trying to just call it like I see it. And that bothers so many people is crazy. I was like, dang, like people are very tribal, very childish, very like sports team esque, And it's, it's really weird. Um, even this video, even though I'm just being totally chill and I'm even going to give my pitch to why I think Trump might be able to game some of these donors, um, people will watch this and perceive this as hate because they hate the thought of not just looking at it like an Avengers movie and it bothers them to look at campaign donations, even though Trump ran on the premise in 2016 of I'll never take their money. I'm so rich. They can't buy me out. But actually, even then, he took hundreds of millions of dollars from mega donors, corporations. And, you know, that's why his cabinet sucked. He didn't make a mistake or get tricked by Jared Kushner. He took hundreds of millions of dollars. And when you take the money, you have to give something in return. And Trump sold out his entire cabinet. He sold out the HHS and FDA to the pharmaceutical industry. There's a case to be made that Trump is more corrupt with pharmaceuticals than even Obama was. It's like, I don't, you know, I don't know how much he really did. He probably didn't revolutionize anything and Obamacare was trash. But, you know, Trump is not better than the establishment. Like he's in some ways almost worse. He's just smoother at pretending like he's not. He does business as we'll look with the abortion video. It's like, I, and, and I want to get your take on it before I say mine, because I haven't even watched it yet. But it's like, He's not a man of much conviction on some things he does, but it's like he's just very smooth. He's a smooth operator. So people don't even know. They're like, oh, he said he wouldn't sell out. Yeah, but then he sold out. He said America will never be socialist, but he was doing socialism while he said it. And none of his base seems to realize. So now that I showed a few donors that were there, Johnson and Johnson, you know, uh, the guy's house who, who, uh, who the guy who owned the house, who probably was a big player, the Soros guy, who were the politicians there? Four politicians were named, and it happens to be four politicians that have been tweeted out. Interesting stuff, just patterns I'm noticing. So it was reported that Tim Scott was there, Vivek Ramaswamy and Doug Burgum were there, and they also got to speak and address the crowd. So why are those four names interesting? Just a couple months ago, uh, Trump's campaign guy, Jason Miller, tweeted out a picture of all four of them. And he said, it's the MAGA Avengers Assemble and also Citizen Free Press, which is brainwashed by Trump, you know, they said MAGA, you know, how awesome is this? I mean, I'm just going to say this. Tim Scott is like the black Mike Pence. Doug Burgum 
sold his state out to Bill Gates. And Vivek Ramaswamy is a pharmaceutical billionaire who said he cried on January 6th. If that's MAGA 2024, I'm a little concerned. You can see here, Doug Burgum get, got a $100,000 donation for, from Bill Gates to run for office. And then he took a picture with him on Facebook because nothing says MAGA like selling your state out to Bill Gates, which is what Doug Burgum did. And also Trump sold out to Bill Gates. Trump, Bill Gates in 2018 said that pres he got President Trump fired up about a universal flu vaccine and also got a job offer from Trump. And you might be like, well, how do I know that that's true that he told Trump to do a universal flu vaccine in 2018? Well, I don't know. In September 20th, 2019, Trump passed an executive order titled Modernizing Influenza Vaccines in the United States. So chances are, if Bill Gates told the press in 2018, hey, I told Trump about this universal flu vaccine and got him really fired up. And then a year and a half later, something that no one has ever heard of, a universal flu vaccine, gets passed through executive order and brings nine different agencies of the government together for a task force in 2019. Chances are Bill Gates wasn't lying to the press because how would he know that Trump was going to pass an executive order for something that he said he told Trump a year and a half ago? So not only is MAGA Avenger Doug Burgum, he sold his state out to, to, uh, uh, to, to Bill Gates. Trump sold the country out to Bill Gates, but his supporters and all the influencers who grift off him are either too fake or stupid to realize it. They just don't want to tell you because they might lose six or seven figures telling you the truth. And then also, you know, the other new age like Mr. MAGA totally not sold out is a pharmaceutical billionaire who is literally running around left and right wing media desperate for attention for five or six years for one of his pharmaceutical project projects, which was like the largest IPO in biotech history, which crashed into the ground. And he was even on Jim Cramer selling it as this. Oh, it's going to, you know, it's like, yeah, the, you mean the stock that went from like 180 to like under a dollar? Yeah, it's like one of the biggest, I'm sure. Yeah, but no one lost their money, right? That's what he tells all the podcasts. Yeah, I'm sure everybody just profited off that like a fortune, but it's whatever. God bless the guy. Uh, I'm just saying what I'm saying. Um, if you want to know what Trump's going to do in his next term, if he wins, just look at who's donating to him and who he hangs around with. But here's the interesting part about next term if Trump wins. People like Bill Ackman, you know, and I think uh, I'm not going to say they're similar, but John Paulson, he seems very similar. They're these billionaire donors who donate a lot of money to liberal Ivy League schools. And then I noticed with Bill Ackman, as soon as the Ivy League schools started protesting for Palestine, he started freaking out about that and DEI. And Sagar from that Crystal and Sagar show, I don't know if they still have a show together, but Sagar nailed it when he talked to Tucker Carlson. He goes, it seems to me like those type of billionaires like Bill Ackman, they're only mad at DEI because their ethnicity and their group is not included in it, which is Jewish. And they don't like the fact that all these kids are protesting for Palestine, obviously. So it's like, what does it say? And this is my take from it. Some people are like, oh, Michael Rappaport's so based now. All these people are getting so based. Are they getting based or are these donors that play both sides? They have no problem funding a liberal school or a conservative politician. It's like, it's, you know, just pay them and hopefully they do what you do. And if not, then you just switch sides. It's, it has nothing to do with being based or red pilled. It's just like, oh, I didn't know these kids were against me. I guess I got to give money to the other side. So the point that I'm trying to make is, you know, big money makes big plays. And I think that, Trump has a little leverage over certain billionaires because I think a lot of billionaires that happen to be Jewish, not all of them, but the ones that are super Zionist and love Israel, I don't think they realize that left wing kids didn't like Israel. Like maybe, maybe they did notice that, but it seems like even the ADL and others, they seem to have miscalculated the youth. Like they thought, you know, we're going to fund all these liberal causes and the left wingers are going to be like pro LGBT, pro black, pro Jewish. And the problem is the left wing youth is pro black, pro LGBT, but they're pro Palestine. They kind of see the Israeli state as, you know, conquerors and white, you know, people who took the land. So now I think a lot of people who had no problem funding liberals, like they didn't mind how left wing liberals were, how crazy they were as long as they didn't include a certain group in their crusade against, you know, Christians and white people, to be honest, or I don't know who else they're mad at, men, Republicans, whatever. And as soon as a lot of people realize this, it's like, whoa, shoot, we didn't realize the kids 
weren't on our side. So now I think a lot of billionaires and a lot of people are panicking because, you know, the youth is who's going to take over in 40 years and 30 years. And 80 to 90 percent of them don't give a crap about Israel and they don't they don't see Jewish as a victim card that they care about. They just group it in with white, which they can't care less about. So I think Trump has leverage. I, I don't know if this is making sense to people, but I think Trump has leverage because a lot of people are running to him like, you know, we need Trump to win now. Trump's the one who's going to stop these kids. Trump's the one who's going to pass anti-First Amendment bills to stop the protest, which he already did before any of this even happened in 2019. Trump passed an executive order with the anti-Semitism speech laws that I told you to basically quash protests and pu push these BDS laws, which make it illegal to boycott, divest, or sanction Israel. In America, you can boycott anything you want. It's your First Amendment right to protest, but not Israel, because Israel is more important than your First Amendment or anyone else. And, you know, as anybody who interviews or debates Candace Owens will tell you, like, yeah, you're important, but this is more important. Like, free speech is important, but this is more important. Like, yeah, all tragedies are important, but this one's more important. So you have to understand that Trump plays along to that 100 percent. And he passed a law that says that you can't boycott the foreign country that he totally doesn't work for because that's hate speech to say that he possibly ever would. Um, you know, I don't know how much money he's getting, et cetera, but I just think that culture culturally now more than ever, Trump has a lot of leverage. Like, you know, the left is going crazy. The left is destroying every major city. All the left wing kids are pro-Palestine. And a lot of the major donors actually don't like that. So this idea like when people say establishment, well, what do you mean by establishment? Because there is different sides of the establishment. Like there's left wing and right wing and certain Fox News is different from NBC. But there's certain policies that NBC and Fox News actually aren't that different. And I would say that there's a lot of angles to the establishment. Left wingers still don't like Donald Trump and a lot of billionaires still don't like Donald Trump. However, a lot of billionaires do like Donald Trump now because they think that he can help with their foreign policy. They're not thrilled that Joe Biden is trying to distance himself. I don't know if people followed this last week, and I don't know how much of what I'm going to say is true because these are just reports that I heard about what Biden's doing. But what I do know that seems to be true is that Israel attacked Iran's embassy, I think, in Syria, which is a huge escalation. It's something that the United States would never do because we don't play like that. I mean, we do do crazy stuff in the Middle East, but not that. And once they did that, there's reports. I don't know how true these are, but reports saying that Biden told Iran America didn't do that. So if you're going to retaliate against Israel, like that's not us. Like, don't attack America for something another country did which you could say is anti-Semitic or really horrible. But at the end of the day, like we have to really come to a conclusion. Are, is it the United States of Israel or is it the United States of America and Israel? Are we allies or are we conjoined at the hip? Because, you know, if we're conjoined at the hip and we're the same country, let's just change the name and get it over with. If we're not, then let's, you know, understand that we could work together. But if working together means that we just give hundreds of billions of dollars of foreign aid and get called anti-Semitic and blood libel anytime you say anything, they even said that Tim Kaine was committing blood libel because he said he doesn't want to get American troops in trouble for what Israel's doing, which is a totally normal stance for an American politician to say that. But you got people on Twitter accusing Tim Kaine of blood libel. Ben Shapiro accuses anybody who disagrees with Israel of blood libel. So it's like at a certain point, you know, Biden, even, I don't like the guy at all, but he's just like, listen, we didn't do that. Don't blame us. Yes, we're funding it, but it's not completely us. They do the same passive aggressive thing in Ukraine. So they don't want to get involved, but they kind of do, but they kind of don't. And, you know, it's an interesting moment, but I think a lot of people are annoyed at that. They want America to be like, yeah, attack us too. Or like when they do something, it's us too. And I think Trump is the guy that they're hoping will be that guy because Trump is super pro Israel. And even though Trump isn't a warmonger, sometimes like he does really like Israel. So maybe he'd do more. So that's what I'm trying to say is that I think Trump actually has a lot of leverage because a lot of billionaire donors that had no problem funding left wing causes for a long time are now freaking out. And they're like, Joe Biden isn't doing what we want him to do completely. The kids are against us. So if the left wing kids are against you, who do you turn to? Not Ghostbusters, Donald Trump. So he's raising tens or you know hundreds of millions of dollars now. He's going to make a fortune. It's not all of that. There's other donors, too, that care about other stuff. Absolutely. But you're lying to yourself if you don't think that this is one of the biggest causes and the biggest money makers for the Republican Party. It absolutely is. Look at the mega donor, Sheldon Adelson, who gave hundreds of millions of dollars to the GOP. 
like it's a huge talk talking point to his family. Miriam now rest in peace, Sheldon Adelson. So now the wife is kind of running the show. It seems like it, it, Israel's a huge tenant of of their foreign policy. So when they donate to Trump, of course they wouldn't want him to distance himself from Israel. Like why would they? He moved the embassy there. Like there's you know there's a lot of things he's done for Israel. The point that I'm trying to make is even though Trump's getting all this donor money, I have a question because obviously only time will tell. Is Trump going to just be a sellout like he was the first time? You pay him enough. He's like a machine. He'll just spit out what you tell him to do. Hires the pharmaceutical industry, hires Mitch McConnell's wife, you know, hires uh, Christopher Ray, whatever. Is he going to be that guy again? Or does, did Trump gain leverage now and gain understanding where Trump's going to say, yeah, I need your money to run for office and pay for my legal fees and, and you know, all the lawsuits. But also you need me as much as I need you because you can't really run to the left anymore because the left wing kids don't really like what you're doing. And even Joe Biden and Tim Kaine seem like they want to distance themselves from Israel a little bit because at the end of the day, you know, Israel and America are different countries. And if Israel does stuff that America doesn't approve of, it's like American soldiers don't want to have to die for that. But I, I can't say that or something because it's blood, blood libel or whatever they're saying it is now. Like if American soldiers had to go to Ukraine and fight, and I'm not saying it's happening. I'm just saying like hypothetically, like, is that the same thing? Like we're not allowed to say that because America is totally like whatever. But, you know, I'm just curious to see how Donald Trump finesses this because I do think that they're looking to him as like, he's going to help us. He's going to conjoin these two countries. And, you know, Trump has gotten in trouble before saying that Israel used to literally own Congress and he's upset that they don't completely own it anymore because of Ilhan Omar and AOC, who, by the way, have like no systemic power on all the Israel resolutions. It's like 300, 400 votes and like Thomas Massey and those and Jamal Bowman, the fire alarm doofus, you know, the, there, there's not much opposition, but to Trump, like, that's a problem. He wants all of Congress to be dominated by that. So, you know, I think that it's hard to tell what Trump's really going to do, because on one hand, he does have leverage. On another hand, I, I don't know who the guy is. You know, like I, I know who I thought he was before, but he showed me he's really not that like his leadership during COVID and even after COVID, after the presidency. And, uh, you know, when it was like 2021 and 2022, the reason DeSantis came became popular for a little while is because Trump, he, he's just very selfish. He just kept talking about the vaccine. And like, I, you know, I, I'm shocked that right wing people don't see through it. I'm not saying not to vote for him, but like, you know, I, it's just wild to me that people still kind of like worship this idea of who they hope he is. And I hope he's that, too. I hope he fixes the border and creates world peace. There's a decent chance of it, I guess. But, you know, I don't really have high hopes, to be honest. I think he'll probably sell his cabinet out. But he does have more leverage now because the left wing kids and the left wing politicians are not doing everything that certain people want to be done. So Trump could hypothetically use that to his advantage and, you know, be like, listen, I'll help you when I can. But also I'm the leader of America. I got to do what I got to do. Will he do that? Will he not? Only time will tell if he wins. But that's my analysis of a lot of the donor money pouring in. But I know that that's hate speech because you can't say that big donors pay to get certain things, even though that's literally what they do. You're not really supposed to say that or whatever. Anyway, let's uh, listen to this clip and let me know what you guys think about what I just said. And this is a four minute clip. I'm just going to let it ride. I haven't heard the whole thing yet, but apparently Trump has ticked off a lot of pro-life crowd because he's trying to make exceptions for abortion and people don't like that that are super pro-life. Me personally. I haven't even heard the clip. So this is my honest live reaction to this four minute clip. I haven't even listened to more than 20, 30 seconds of it yet. So here it goes. The Republican Party will always support the creation of strong, thriving and healthy American families. We want to make it easier for mothers and families to have babies, not harder. That includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republicans, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious baby. What could be more beautiful or better than that? Today, I'm pleased that the Alabama legislature has acted very quickly 
and pass legislation that preserves the availability of IVF in Alabama. They really did a great and fast job. The Republican Party should always be on the side of the miracle of life and the side of mothers, father, their beautiful babies, and that's what we are. IVF is an important part of that, and our great Republican Party will always be with you in your quest for the ultimate joy in life. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights, especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones on this position because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is, the baby is born, the baby is executed after birth, is unacceptable, and almost everyone agrees with that. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. Do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself. Do what's right for your children. Do what's right for our country and vote. So important to vote. At the end of the day, it's all about will of the people. That's where we are right now, and that's what we want, the will of the people. I want to thank the six justices, Chief Justice John Roberts, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, and Neil Gorsuch, incredible people, for having the courage to allow this long-term, hard-fought battle to finally end. This 50-year battle over Roe v. Wade took it out of the federal hands and brought it into the hearts, minds, and vote of the people in each state. It was really something. Now it's up to the states to do the right thing. Like Ronald Reagan, I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. You must follow your heart on this issue, but remember, you must also win elections to restore our culture and, in fact, to save our country, which is currently, and very sadly, a nation in decline. Our nation needs help. It needs unity. It needs us all to work closely together. Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, everyone, we have to work together. We have to bring our nation back from the brink, and that's where it is. It's at the brink, and we will. We will do it. I promise you, we will do it. Always go by your heart, but we must win. We have to win. We are a failing nation, but we can be a failing nation no longer. We will make our nation great. We will make our nation greater than ever before. Thank you very much. Interesting. Well, I want to say this real quick. I saw a lot of people in the comments saying like, you know, I'm not voting for this guy. I, I don't know that some people probably don't care. This is a hot button issue, abortion, because there's a lot of people that really care about it. Like a lot of left wing women, it's like a huge thing for them. But there's also tens or possibly hundreds of millions of pro-life people. And, you know, I had Chad Jackson on the show, my buddy who uh, has been in multiple documentaries, and he's always got an interesting take. And Chad told me that he voted for Trump in 2016 because of his pro-life stance. So, you know, these people are not the most outspoken. I'm not saying Chad, but pro-life people, you might not see them all over the media all the time. But there are millions of people who, who vote on that topic. That's important to them. Um with that being said, you know, my main message before I give my take on this is people need to stop chasing politicians in circles because this is how politics work. They have red, they have blue, one of them's orange, one of them's black, one of them's old and can barely talk or whatever. And, uh, you know, jokes aside in general, or not really a joke, I'm kind of serious, but they 
argue and they talk. And this one says he wants to take away the Second Amendment, but doesn't do it. This one says he wants to defend it, but he infringes on it. The left says they're not so sure about free speech anymore. The right says we need to defend free speech as Trump and DeSantis are passing anti-free speech laws for one race, one religion, one country. And the Overton window shifts towards insanity. And it doesn't matter who you vote for at a certain point because the country's in a different direction, whether it's abortion, whether it's these DEI laws, whether it's you know pharmaceuticals, you know, the, where we are now is not necessarily where we were 20 or 30 years ago. But once the country moves so far culturally in that direction, there's almost nothing you can do because either you have to do what Trump's doing to try to win an election or, you know, you lose the election because that's not popular anymore. Personally, on this topic, I would say that pro-life people, if you're voting for, I'm sorry, pro-choice, if you're voting pro-choice and that's your take, you're probably going to vote for Biden. I'm not sure if this is even going to sway a single vote. It's possible, but you know, it's it's like one of those things like you cave to the left and they still don't like you because you'll never be far enough. They pro probably want Biden to go further on the topic. So I, I don't know how many votes this is going to help Trump with morally. Obviously, a lot of Christians and religious people will say it's just morally like demonic, like you're you're willing to end a life in order to win an election. And then some people don't care. There's a lot of Republicans that are pro-choice or they just don't care about abortion. It's not a topic that matters to them. They want the border secured or they want to end the wars and abortion means nothing to them. Me with my show, this like people always think I'm anti-Trump or anti this or this, that. Like there's always a word. Are you pro this? Are you anti that country? Are you I'm American? I'm a Christian. I'm a human being. I, you know, I'm a news analyst. I'm a hip hop artist. I like sports. But at the end of the day, I'm not following characters in circles. Like I'm not a fan. I'm not like a fan stan where I'm like, you know, I don't think God put me on this earth or put you on this earth to just be a mindless NPC, whether you're left wing or right wing. There's millions of right wing NPCs where it's like, I don't have any thoughts of my own. Whatever he says, he knows best. It's like, then get pom poms. You know what I'm saying? And try to get paid for it. Like, what are you doing that for free? But in general, outside of that, it doesn't matter who wins the election because the culture is getting shifted by a lot of different methods. So what we have to do is shift the culture back in the right direction. I was so pumped last week because I accomplished two things that I've been trying to accomplish for five years. And I might have seemed a little arrogant about it. I'm honestly just incredibly excited, not for what's going on in the world. It's in insane. But as far as culturally in America... There's two things that I've been wanting to happen that are now happening because people are talking about it. Like I wanted Republicans to cover this topic of the hate speech laws for five years. Nobody wanted to cover it. Now they're covering it. Why did Matt Walsh just wake up and cover it because he wanted to? No, they would have never covered it. It was because we stopped running circles around Donald Trump or Daily Wire and enough people came together and were like, bro, why don't you talk about this topic? Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro. I don't care who debates Ben Shapiro. Hopefully someone who knows what they're talking about or else Ben's going to look smart. But someone, he's been de uh, uh, dodging debates on this topic for five or six years. You know, people like Ben will tell you that you don't have and you can't have an opinion on the word anti-Semitism. I'm not saying he says that directly, but a lot of people in that area will be like, well, you know, if you're not Jewish, you can't have an opinion on anti-Semitism. Well, it's being passed into legislation. So now that multiple Republicans are infringing on the First Amendment and passing hate speech laws, I actually can have an opinion on it because it's infringing on my liberty. If it's just your word, then no, I don't care. I don't need an opinion on it. But you can't tell me I can't have an opinion on something that's being passed against the Constitution. That's crazy. That's abusive to you know the country and, and, and free citizens in this country. So it's like the reason I just brought that up is because that's how you get results, not by being a fan. So with Trump, he's got like Every politician is going to be pro-abortion in 10 years because that's the that's the way the country's moving. You know, you, we got to push back against the degeneracy and insanity in order to maintain the country. Just simply voting and loving Trump is not going to get the job done. You know, like he, for the first time, you know, and this is not necessarily my take, but I've seen Bryson Gray and a lot of people. They're saying for the first time in American history, there's two pro-choice candidates. Yes, Trump says exceptions, but you know, most pro-life people do not like that. They they think a life is a life. People like, um, what's her name? Kathy Barnett. She was the product of, of rape, you know, and now she's an incredible woman. And yes, obviously that's a dark topic to talk about. And it's really rough to try to get involved in someone else's life. But it's like Kathy Barnett's a great person. And uh, she's an interesting American. 
And, uh, you know, she wouldn't be here if they just said to get rid of her. So that's how a lot of pro-life people and a lot of Christians think. Trump is not that guy. So for the first time ever, you essentially have two semi-pro-choice candidates. This was never a thing for, you know, the last 300 years. Um, things are going to keep going in this direction until people stop chasing the tail of the donkey or the elephant and start having their own perspectives and trying to explain it. My personal opinion on abortion, if anybody cares, I don't think I'm the, the voice that people go to on this topic. But in my early days, when I was in my 20s, I didn't think much of it. I guess I would say I was pro-choice, but it wasn't like a I wasn't like a feminist or whatever at women's marches. It was just like I get like it's normalized in society. I'm not really pro-choice. It's just society was pro-choice. And I was like, I guess I don't, like I don't see why that shouldn't be a thing. As I get older, now I kind of understand. And, I, you know, as a news analyst and somebody with somewhat of influence, I'm just trying to reframe the conversation around this stuff. I'm not trying to fight over this and that. I'm just trying to speak directly of how I feel. And hopefully that will change people's minds and hearts on this topic. Let me explain myself. I didn't engage in the birth control debate on Twitter a couple of weeks ago because people were being annoying. But my take on it is we need to explain what sex really is to people, whether it's girls or boys, or I'm not talking about at a young age, but once people are in their teens and in, in college, et cetera, it's like having sex creates a baby. We're told, I was told in my teens and in my twenties, you know, I was bombarded with pornography. You're bombarded with casual sex and music and movies. It's cool. And all these kids, and like, if you were pro-life and you didn't weren't having sex because of Jesus. Everybody thought you were a loser when I was in college. Like most kids were like, go, go, go out and get drunk and try to have sex with someone. It's a crazy thing to do. Even crazier is taking pills to basically arrange your body to not have a kid if, if somebody nuts in you. I'm sorry I'm being like blunt on it. It's just it's just crazy. And like I don't have that possibility because I'm not a woman. But it's it's a weird it's it's just weird. Like millions of women are, are taking birth control. And it's like basically like I'm going to rearrange how my body works to shut off my baby making production skills because I want to have sex without a condom or I don't trust condoms or whatever. And I don't want a kid for that reason. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. Like I don't know the health consequences of it, but I could just imagine God put women on earth, not just for that reason, but it's like you have one of the most magical powers in all of human history, which is creating new life in, in, in your body. I, I would say it is the most incredible thing. I'm not saying you have to have a kid, but it's like you're going to take pills to rearrange how your body works to prevent it from having a kid. I can only imagine what that does to your mind and your body. But do you see how I'm talking about it? I'm just being real with it. I'm not shaming women who take it. I'm not telling people what to do. But if you think about it, how I'm saying it, which is the truth, it's actually crazy. And then most people wouldn't want to do it. If you just fight on Twitter and start shaming OnlyFans hoes and stuff or whatever, it's, it is what it is. But it's like, you know, then it just becomes this cultural left and right. Rah, 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 rah. But like, that's just how I see it. I'm not shaming anybody. It's just it's a crazy thing to do. Myself as a guy, of course, I'm not perfect. Even in my later years, it's not like I'm just walking around doing everything perfect. I wish I was perfect. Life would be easier. But in general, I'm way wiser than I was when I'm young. Like when I was young, I thought casual sex was incredible. Now, you know, I've done pretty well for myself. I enjoy my life. I want eventually a family and children. So if I want a family and children with one woman and I want to be loyal, why would I be having a bunch of casual sex with random chicks? Because it like, especially once you start doing well, or even if you don't do well, it's, it's, it's scary either way. If you're not doing well, like in my 20s, I don't even have the money or resources to like, what would I do with a kid? And then when you are doing well, it's like, what if I had a kid with a woman that I didn't love? That, that's scary. That's very scary. So I just don't do it anymore because it's not like I don't want to do it or there's nothing fun about it, but it really actually isn't fun to me anymore because I think about all this stuff and it's like, yeah, it's not, I don't live in a rap song anymore where it's like, I don't want to have a kid with a woman that I don't like. So the real way, I know it sounds corny if you just say it to like a 19 year old who doesn't want to hear this, but the truth is uh, it's not cool to have casual sex. It's not cool to take birth control. And it, everything that they're teaching us is just the unnatural, insane thing to do. 
I'm not shaming people with abortion because, you know, some of those are, are extreme examples. And I get that that's a dicey situation. But in general, it's like, you know, the best way to not have a kid is to not have a kid. And just like a guy shouldn't be, you know, making love to you like that, you, you know, to, to, to last second, like rip the thing out of your body. Like it's not a pleasant experience, not for the woman, not for anybody, not for the man. So like, you know, I'm not shaming people or telling them what to do, but if there were more people educating women and men on, on these topics in an honest and, and fair manner, I think a lot of the kids would realize that it is actually crazy. And, you know, I don't want to take shots at other people now, but I do feel that Republicans do not pick the best speakers to go on college campus. They pick the kids that are sold out to donors and people that are handpicked to worship a foreign country and pass speech laws for them. And then on all these cultural topics, they're always so divisive. You know, it's always like a huge cat fight. It's always a yell and a, and a shame. And it's like it's a, it, it seems to me like they don't even want people to figure this stuff out. They just want to keep people divided on these topics. But, you know, morally, personally, I don't believe in uh, abortion anymore. I do think it's wrong. I think birth control is wrong. And I think men having casual sex is wrong. Am I shaming you? Am I telling you you're the worst person in the world? No, because everybody does something that they probably shouldn't do. You know, like humans are not all Jesus. You know, I, you can get close to God and be better and, and and minimize your sins. But I don't know. I don't know that anyone can achieve perfection. Maybe some people can. I'm not shaming people. It's just like we need to frame, in my opinion, the conversation this way. You know, birth control to take the power that God gave you to create life and artificially just manipulate your body in order to shut off your superpower is way more toxic than it is to just cho be choosy you know as a man casual sex is fun for as long as it lasts you know if you, if you really got it in bed it might last you half an hour to an hour if if you're if you're shooting quick it might last you 10 seconds but <laughs> regardless of how long you're lasting like it's only really fun until then if you don't love the person or you don't like them that much now you got to worry about, did I just have a kid? Did I just make a mistake? Did I just get this? It's actually not fun. You know, it's 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 uh, it's like about as fun as doing heroin, where it's like, I'm sure that's fun for a little bit. And then it's not, you know, and I don't know. I've never done it. I'm just saying like heavy drugs. The reason people do them is because they, they seem fun for a little bit. But then the damage it does to you is like astronomical and the spiritual and physical and mental damage it does to men and women is, is rough. And, uh, you know, nobody's perfect. Everybody needs to get their thrills. And especially as human beings, like I think we're wired to want to do these things. So it's like, I'm not, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm not asking, I don't think people can really fully achieve it, but like just knowing this and being aware of this makes you a more conscious person. This is my opinion. I'm not a preacher. I don't know that this is like biblical because I think you're supposed to do better than I'm saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm lowering the bar just to be reasonable. This is just my opinion unprofessionally, self-awareness and self-accountability are, are the most important things. In order to be self-accountable, you have to be self-aware. If you don't have self-awareness, you can never be accountable for anything. The worst people, I've, I said on Twitter the other day, the best people of every race, they don't complain about racism and they don't complain about hate towards their people. They, like, they, they just live and they are, and, and you treat them differently because they are different because they, they demand respect or they're nice or they're kind to of be around their energy. You treat them like the spirit they are. The worst people of every race, including my own race, they're the ones always crying about everything. It's like they're so annoying and they try to project their annoyance on everybody else. It's, it's just annoying. So in general, it's the same with self-awareness. If you don't have the understanding of what's right and wrong, it's almost impossible to do what's right you got to at least understand it first. And then once you get the self-awareness of how things work, then you can start being accountable on different things and you become a better person. You might not be perfect, but you can at least try. If you're not trying on any of these topics of birth control and sex and anything, like you're not trying at all, you you don't even know what's right or you believe the complete wrong, then it, you're just a mess. So um, on this topic, I think telling people about this is is extremely important. On the abortion side of this, you know, Trump is taking a moderate stance that's not traditional Christian. What do you guys think? Let me ask you, I'm, you know, do you think that, how did you take what he said? Because he talked for four minutes and didn't really say much. What is IVF? What is that, in vitro or something? I got to even look, because I, I, I apologize for being like, in vitro fertilization is combining, 
Yeah, I don't like is IVF weird or I, I'm not really I've heard of it, but I, I can't act like I really have studied the science of it to even know what it fully is. He said IVF and, and abortions for rape and incest. And he's also before I don't know in that video said that, you know, before heartbeat, I think he's OK with sometimes someone said I like Trump's speech. I agree with him. I feel like it's a bad idea. Let's see. It was a proper American take by Trump. It, abortion is like the most wedged topic, like women, liberal women and some conservative women that like abortions. They just that's really important to them. And some men. Pro-life people being against it is extremely important. They literally think it's murder. So it's like, you know, saying anything, you're going to lose that side. Do you guys think this is my question? Do you think he's going to get pro-abortion votes by taking that stance? Or do you think he's going to gain more pro-abortion votes or do you think he's going to lose more pro-life people? Th see, that's where I, I don't know that Republicans ever get as much support as they think they are. Like if Trump comes out and he does all these things for black people and he's like, I love black people. Here's all this stuff. It, the, the, the polls don't just swing in his favor because he panders and does some things like it never, ever works like that. I think he'll get more black votes this time for other reasons. But, you know, I, I don't know if like the caving on topics works but i don't to be honest i don't think trump is caving i don't think he cares like he's not i don't think he's really that christian or or, or conservative to be honest i think he's more of like a reasonable businessman who just like you know can kind of see all sides like i don't i don't i don't think he is who people want him to be personally so i don't i don't know that he ever had the opinion of like the christians that like him he just probably said it um Someone said, I'm pro minding your own business. Fair. Someone said, lose pro life. They won't vote for anyone. Uh, he said the exact same stance on abortion as Lindsey Graham. That's not how not conservative he is. Uh, he's not on our level. He's just playing his own game. Why would a Christian vote for Trump? I don't, you know, I have to be honest when I'm not good at stuff. I, it's hard for me to tell what everyone's going to do. I know what I think, but what I think is one person. So I like, I can't tell you if this is going to hurt or help him. My best guess would be, which is not for sure, is that he's going to lose more pro-life votes than he's going to gain pro-choice. I personally think left-wingers who are super pro-choice, I don't think that's going to do it. And uh, that's why, at least for me, like I think educating people and shifting culture is more important because there's going to be more and more pro-choice people if all the kids hate Republican boomers like, you know, and they, and they don't like what you're doing or like what you're saying. If you can explain to them with compassion why birth control is wrong and why casual sex is not great and why, you know, abortions should not be had and should 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 not even be so common if people took accountability and thought about these things. It, it's got to be said with 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 thoughtfulness, though, and, and to, to where it's like it's convincing people, because at the end of the day, I'll, I'll just say this. One of the takes I hear from people like Cernovich on Twitter, like he always has an interesting take. He's like, if Trump loses, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, like if he loses the election, then pro-life is happening anyway. So it's like people don't want it to happen. But if, if, if he loses because of that topic, then none of your opinions even matter. Personally, I don't think Trump is going to gain that many votes. I, I I think it's overrated caving. I think explaining compassionately is more is is more convincing than caving. Even with Vivek, you know, I'll say this about, and I don't know if it's because of his ethnicity, but I, I know someone who is Asian and his wife was liberal. And he told me that his wife was starting to get more conservative because Vivek was uh, explaining things like she never was conservative, but she liked Vivek. I think people like people, you know, if, if you like, like if you like a rock star, like Taylor Swift or whatever, she's not really a rock star, but I guess so country star. Um, you tend to like, oh, I like their personality. I like who they are. I liked Ron Paul when I was younger. I had no idea Ron Paul was libertarian. I didn't even know what that word meant. I just, my instinct, my soul told me, I like Ron Paul. The other candidates are trash. Like I had instinctually, I knew that at a young age and I was right. Um, you know, that's my opinion on all these topics is caving on topics is, is overrated. You don't actually get votes. Being a likable person and explaining it thoughtfully and honestly is what brings people to you and becomes attracted to you. So 
is Trump going to blow the minds of pro-life liberals? No, because this is my problem with the pro-life side. Besides a lot of things is like, where do you draw the line? They don't draw the line. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's like, it's crazy, you know, like, okay. You, you ask a Democrat politician and they don't want to draw any line. Six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, 20 weeks, mid birth. These people are psychopaths. It's like, you know, they have no line and, and and that's what people are voting for. They don't want a line. So if you draw a line, no matter what line you're drawing, it pisses off most Democrat voters. So, you know, I think caving is overrated and, uh, you know, just be, having a good message and being a, a likable person is underrated. Uh, and, but I don't think Trump is caving. I just don't think he ever was who people thought he was on the, on this topic. Like if pro-life people thought he was that, it's not that he's caving. He's just like, I'm not going to, you know, I think Trump come to the conclusion. I'm not going to pretend to be like super, you know, opinionated about this topic that I'm not. I'm more like Reagan. I think there should be, um, you know, exceptions. Uh, $10 super chat. Someone said, hey, anomaly kind of random, but would you want to go to Mar-a-Lago May 8th for a Trump NFT gala? Got an extra ticket. Was going to go through X, but couldn't ask. <sighs> not, do I want to? Not really. No, not really. Um yeah, I appreciate the offer, but I, I don't know. It would be cool to ask questions and kind of interview, but I'm not, that's not like, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe to like do conduct some interviews or something, or would he get pissed at me? Am I allowed to do that at Mar-a-Lago? I'm not really sure the dynamic. Would, would everyone hate me there now? I'm not really sure. I wanted to say this too about, uh, you know, someone said this to me, and, and most people understood what I was doing, but someone said to me, Anomaly, I'm not surprised that certain people don't want to work with you. They're, uh, you know, you, you're not like, if you say these things about them, they're not going to want to network with you. Like you, you need to get better at like personal skills, right? It's cool. I'm not really tripping about it, but I, I thought about it because I was like, I'm pretty self-aware. I have good personal skills. I'm good at like, I think I'm a likable person in person. I'm good at networking. In conservative media, there there comes a point where you figure out do i want to network or or do i want to do the right thing and i came to that point not just in politics but i came in the music industry like i had no problem networking to the point and showing my talent to the point where i got meetings but then in the meetings it's like do i want to just be a schmoozer or do i want to stand firm on my values and i said i want to just kind of not do what they want me to do. And then you lose the network. It's the same thing with politics. It's like, it's not, it's not that I can't network. Like I could be like Vivek or Patrick, but it's, it's fine. I'm not, it's not like I can't talk or I'm like awkward or I'm a dickhead or something. I'm not like that in person at all. It's just like, it gets to a certain point where I have to decide, do I want to conduct a real interview or do I just want to be friends with everybody? And the problem in politics is everybody wants to be friends with everybody to a certain fault to the point where it's like, if you go to Mar-a-Lago, right? And, you know, Trump's taking hundreds of millions of dollars from donors. And then you realize he's doing something that no, none of the patriots want him to do because of the donor money. Like now you're faced with an option. If you're a reporter or a journalist, do you report that and just say like, you know, Trump's kind of selling out or do you shut your mouth and continue to network? So that's just my kind of self-defense on it. Not that I need to. I don't, I don't have a problem with like networking or, or personal skills. Like, it's not like I'm awkward in person. I think I'm a likable guy. It's just, I came to the conclusion at certain points, I can't coexist in the space, you know, like, and do my job. I just can't like with Ben and Charlie, I never said anything negative about them ever until I realized that they were gatekeeping hate speech laws. And that was the fork in the road in 2019. Do I get more famous in Republican politics and get hired by these people and, and, and do the college tours? Or do I tell my audience that they're, it seems like they have no interest in free speech when it comes to a certain country? I took the route of just talking about it. And uh, yeah, of course, it throws off the network, but it's not like I'm out here just purposely burning bridges. It's just that's the game that you have to play in politics. And I, I don't want to play it. And I, think that's why nothing changes. Like, I don't see it as like, oh, if I sucked up, I'd get all these out. Yeah. I might be, a, I might be able to add another zero to, to my like bank account, but at what cost? Isn't that being a sellout? If you make more money by not taking that, 
I want to read this comment too, because this lady, Denise, I want to see, seems like she wrote a long thing. So you take that much time. This guy's lost many supporters when he started name calling and showed his hate for Trump over the good of the country. I don't like the comments Trump makes all the time, as well as the prior presence. But here's the thing. The truth sounds like hate speech to people who hate the truth. If I say Trump took a million dollars from Pfizer and then hired pharmaceutical lobbyists, I'm not, that's not hate speech. You perceive it as hate speech because you hate the thought that he did that. I think noticing this stuff and pointing it out is what stops it. You think calling it hate speech is going to fix the country. But when you call the truth hate speech and you hate hearing this stuff, that's why it continues. We fundamentally disagree on how to fix this stuff. You just have pom-poms in your hand and you're like NPC number 5,476. And then everybody just says, I'm being hateful all the time. Oh, he hates this country because he believes in the First Amendment. Oh, he hates this if he believes in that. Oh, he hates Trump if he says that. It's not hate. It's just the reality of the situation. And the reason it keeps continuing is because nobody says it. And that's where I'm at with the networking and stuff. Like I have, I went to the White House in 2019. You know, I got invited to places. Um, I appreciate it, but at, at what cost? You know, like do, how, do, how bad do I want to be there? Like I, you know, I'm not going to name names, but I know like, you know, friends of mine that were in conservative media, they're like fighting over donors and stuff like, and they're not even making good content. They're not even doing anything. It just becomes this game of like money and power. And, you know, if, if I work my ass off and make a certain amount of money and you could get a donor to give you that money in a day, if you want, if your goal is to make money, it's smarter to go to the donor meetings and go, you know, network because that's where all the money is. But that's not, I'm not interested in that. Like that's obviously I don't want to be broke, but it's like, I don't, it's not a game for me. Like I, I'd rather put out a hundred great videos that, that make a difference in a year then put out one video and suck up $10 million from a donor. Like it, it, that's not an appealing lifestyle to me, but that's what people are doing in politics. That's, that's the game that's being played. It, you know, I just, I don't agree that I'm being hateful or I can't, I don't know how to like have personal skills. It's just like, that's not how I see it. Um, someone said, I like Brandon Tatum, but his strategy is to pretend he doesn't know the entire picture and say nothing. I like Brandon too. I met him. He's a nice guy, but yeah, I, I, I unfollowed him on Instagram. No hard feelings. It's just like his content. Like, it, I don't know. He's just like, it just got to the point where I, it wasn't appealing to me for similar reasons. I just, you know, kind of outgrew it, but he's a nice guy. Nothing really bad to say. would love to chat with him. It's just, you know, that there's a certain audience for certain content for me. It's just not appealing to me anymore. Um, Someone said, if you actually care about human life, hating Trump post Saudi deal is based. Yeah, but I guess like I'm not, I'm not like hating. I'm not like, oh, I hate him. It's just like if he did that and it was wrong or whatever. I just think things change when people notice it and call it out. I don't agree with this like idol worship of him, but most, most people perceive everything that way because they're being fed a narrative that this side's trying to get them and in the way to fight that side is to just to be behind them and anybody that's not completely behind them is the bad guy you know like that's that's like the narrative that most people are pumping out so like the lady on facebook she'll be like you you said all these things about him in the name calling i mean i called him grandpa moderna and the in the vaccine salesman but it is semi name calling but it's like the the name it's just like he calls Ted Cruz, lion Ted Cruz, you know, he makes, he makes names for everybody. And it's hilarious. Do you say, Oh, I like Donald Trump until he started name calling. And this is why a lot of, you know, I would say not all, but a lot of Trump supporters, most people outside of the Trump space, they don't take you seriously. It's not because you're so awesome and right about everything, but you have double standards and hypocrisy for everything. It's like if a Soros donor does something with Ron DeSantis, you say, oh, I can't vote for Ron DeSantis. But if Trump is even more connected to that donor or, or to Soros money, you don't say anything like you're not honest people. You're just idol worshipers of a guy and you have no consistency. I don't care if, if calling people names is your red line makes total sense. I, I like to joke around and make up like funny nicknames, but Trump is the king of funny nicknames. He's, he's got a funny nickname for literally every person. I, I, there's 30 nicknames and name calling. Like that's all Trump does is name calling. And I think it's actually funny when, when he's honest, when he's like doing it to people that I like, then yeah, I'm not like the biggest fan, but uh, like that, that's not your real red line in the sand. It's like, did you like Trump until he name called and then you stopped liking him? 
No, it's just like you have these fake rules for me. It's like, well, you said the truth about this, but you said a name call. So now I can't hear it. It's like, okay. All right. I'm going to read a few more and then I'm going to keep this one somewhat brief. Someone said, I don't know what you're talking about uh, of the campus. I haven't seen the. Let's see. Someone said it's not appealing if you pretend to be pro-life. Are you are you talking about the abortion thing? I don't I don't know if you're talking about me or just that in general. Patrick said, "Do you think Trump ever gets word of your criticism so he can rethink his positions?" Um mine specifically, I I'm not sure. Does Trump know that his audience doesn't like his vaccine sales pitches? Absolutely. I know for a fact that a lot of people have told Trump about that, but here's the thing. He doesn't care and he doesn't need to care. So, it, you know, Trump is a businessman and he looks at his supporters like they're going to like me anyway. So I don't have to change. Like if Trump knew if I don't change on this topic, my supporters won't like me, then he would change. But he, he knows not. I don't know that Trump knows my specific videos. It's not out of the realm, but I'm not going to say for sure. He a thousand percent knows that a lot of his supporters and a lot of influencers don't like the vaccine stuff. But Trump he, he doesn't care, you know, because he doesn't have to care. It's nothing changes until enough people care. The reason Trump will cave, he'll cave on, on, on abortions before he caves on speech laws or the vaccine, because he knows Republicans are suckers. He knows you have to vote for him and he wants the other side to like him. So it's like, that just shows you if enough people cared, he would change. Cause by being pro vaccine or pro operation warp speed, he's not picking up any Democrat votes because of that. He's just virtue signaling to his big pharma donor friends. Like I did that. You know what I'm saying? I, I got it done. I'm the guy. It wasn't Biden. I did it for you, which is true. I mean, you know, I, I wonder obviously what would happen if Hillary got in, but like, would Hillary have done operation warp speed too? I assume so. But like Trump is almost in the category now where he's so, entangled with pharmaceutical scams like he might be the worst i don't know but it's hard to think that democrats would be that much better today what julia said people get mad when you tell the truth about trump but don't complain when hearing conservatives say the same rhetoric about democrats day to day well it's just npc behavior unfortunately it's like left versus right right and and that's even with all the content on the donor stuff i talked about earlier people don't think very deeply like they're not like oh i wonder who donated to him and what they want out of trump and how it's going to influence his thing it's just like clap 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 i'm a seal clap 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 trump raised money clap 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 take that left clap 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 and then that's what all the content creators are doing not all of them but a lot of them so it's like you know they're basically just dumbing down the, the conservative base and the dumber the base gets the easier it is to trick and manipulate everybody so it would be beneficial to all of us if people paid attention more but it's not it's not like trendy to pay attention. It's more trendy to just be like, to be like a cheerleader, you know, like whether it's Trump or Biden, I'm interested in where they're taking money from and who they hire now, especially now after like the last four or five years. Um, MS with a $20 super chat said, people reject your inconvenient observations, probably have the same mentality as those who will not vote third party. It's a fear that if you point it out, Trump loses votes and Biden wins and that allows the corruption to persist. I think you're right. And I think that that is what I've heard from a lot of people for a long time. Um, in 2019, before the lockdown, I had mentioned to my friends, I had, I have a lot of friends that do conservative commentary, but a few of them that I hung out with in person, I was telling them, I was like, you know, I could think of two people specifically. I'm not going to say, cause it doesn't matter, but you know, they're pretty big content creators. And, and I said to them, dude, I just realized Trump is passing these like speech laws and these anti-protest laws. And I said, my opposition to it is strictly First Amendment, it has nothing to do with race, religion, or a country. It's, it's, it's unconstitutional and it doesn't make sense. And it's, it's everything that we claim to be against. And both of them told me, well, actually one of them told me the election's coming up. This was in 2019. It wasn't even election year, but the elections next year, don't talk about it. They said that's like, you know, I, it's not worth talking about it now. So that's when I realized. So you you tell everybody you're a patriot and blah, blah, blah. You know, like you're so this and that, whatever. 
but you're okay with the first amendment and free speech being infringed on because you want to win an election winning an election without the first amendment kind of sucks though and like that's their mindset exactly what you said and then the other person like i was explaining to him in 2020 about the speech laws and he he never said you're anti-semitic or that's hate speech he was like no you're totally right he's like i'm I, i'm just not like i just have no interest in talking about that you know that, that like that's just the truth is like yeah i don't know i think a lot of people they see it that way don't ever talk about the bad things that he's doing because we need to win the next election and if you've noticed the election is always in two years so there's always a mid every two years is a midterm and then every two years is a is a main election for the president so two 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 if you say one year before an election it's it's a year before the election don't talk about it now it's always a year before an election this is the two-party trap it's like that's how Democrats think too. It's like, oh, the election's coming up. The elections are always coming up for the end of time until they cancel it like Zelensky in Ukraine. So no party's ever going to mention what their party's doing. It's And then the same donors and the same people are, are basically lobbying both sides of politics. Like it, that is the trick. So, you know, I'm just being patient because I know now either Trump, Trump's going to win or he's going to lose. And if he wins, either he's going to do a great job or he's going to do a shitty job. Like I understand there's only so many outcomes. So at the end of the day, it's like people will wake up when they want to, not when I want them to. And that's where I've become more wise. I'm not stressing over it. I'm not yelling at my audience like I was a couple of years ago. I mean, I was kind of annoyed during COVID because like, it was like, yo, wake up. I don't want to be locked down forever. But uh, in general, you know, if Trump wins, either he's going to crush or he's not. But if he doesn't, everyone's going to remember who's, who who was early on it. So it's, you know, it, it's just like now I wanted people to learn about this topic four years ago. Now everybody cares about it because of certain worldly outcomes. And, you know, it just that's just the timing. It, it is. It's not what you want it to be. It's just what it is. So I'm not even when people in the comments are like, you hate Trump, blah, blah, blah. It's like it's no. But if you want to think that, just enjoy yourself, have a good year and let things play out, you know. And before I read a few more comments, what I said at the beginning is what I'm trying to explain to people. I am I could sit here and say that I think I'm so smart that I could see the future. Maybe that would be like a good pitch to get some QAnon moms or something, but I don't think what I'm doing is that special. In fact, I think you and everyone watching can do this. I'm not acting like I'm better than anyone. I literally think everyone can do this. And a lot of my supporters did it with or without me, you know, whether I influence that or not, a lot of people knew probably even before me. But the truth is, there's a reason I was right about the vaccine and Ben Shapiro was wrong about the vaccine. There was a reason that I was ahead of Trump and all his supporters on lockdowns and COVID testing and every element of the pandemic and the speech laws. There's a reason I'm five years ahead of Matt Walsh. Like, it's not because I'm so special and I'm so smart and I'm getting secret codes from Jesus. It's because I pay attention and I don't chase money, fame, donor meetings. I don't work for a foreign country. I don't uh, worship any, you know, like I, I'm not like, being biased even with my own country i see my own country's flaws i don't even worship the government of this country and also i don't just run circles around donald trump that's what all the dummies do there's a reason they're always five years or two years or three years behind i'm watching where the ball moves they're chasing the laser pointer like a cat or, or, an, or an animal chasing a tennis ball that's the truth like i said there were mandatory vaccines coming in 2019 how did i know that they were coming before they came because I was paying attention to legislation in, in in New Jersey and California. It was starting to happen. And guess who cared about it? Very few people. Why? Because most people, it's Trump or not Trump. They see everything through Trump. If Trump talked about it, they'd notice. If he doesn't, they won't. If he does it, they'll defend it. Like They're like animals. You know That's why the elites think you're animals is because people literally act like animals. And it's like, if you don't want to get treated like an animal, Stop acting like them. You know, it's it's that simple. They tell you to lock in your house and you listen. You know, that's what a caged animal does. I'm just saying it's like it's it's not that hard to figure out what's coming because it, it, it's it gets ignored by 95 percent of conservative and liberal influencers before it happens because they're always creating this WWE drama plot. You know, like I why was I five years ahead of Matt Walsh on the speech laws? Because when they passed it into legislation and someone brought it to my attention on Twitter or YouTube and I was watching the, it was like, oh, 
and then I researched it and I was like, oh, I like Trump, but this is not what I want. You know, like, and, and people will say that I'm cocky or arrogant. It's more arrogant to be like, I want this to happen. So I'm going to pretend like it's happening. Like that's arrogant. That's even more egotistical. Like you can't accept that somebody you like did something that you don't like. It's, it's very childish, you know? Um, it's like, I want him to not do that. So I just will assume that he has a plan. It's like, it's like fake, you know, it's just weird. So I acknowledge that Trump could absolutely do a good job if he gets back into office or he could be even worse. But the people that think he's just going to crush or it's like, you know, you're just four years behind. And then like when something doesn't happen, then you're going to be like, why? Everyone will figure it out at a certain point. Like who is Trump's cabinet? If he wins, who's the cabinet? That'll tell you everything. Treasury, secretary of state, blah, blah, blah. Vice president. Like look at his cabinet see who it is. And that's how his presidency is going to run. If you want to see how his foreign policy is going to be, look who he puts as secretary of state. Look at their foreign policy and who their allegiances are to or what they think of the Ukraine war and the Israel war. And that's probably the direction his presidency is going to go, at least if his administration has any say in the matter. It's not uh, hateful to say that. So MP said, that's why I've told my friends who see Trump as the savior, if they could foresee the future on these things, do they really think Trump didn't know what's going on? Either he's dumb or he's in on it. You know, everybody has their own perception, but I think a lot of people, they have bi biblical, I don't know, is biblicalized a word? I'm just going to make it one. Like they, they, they have decided that he's the biblical character that they want him to be. Um, and, and that's the narrative that they're going with. Like, you know, this is his role. He's going to do it. It's possible. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's like there's also some people who think that Trump is the Antichrist. You know, I'm, I'm not saying Trump is the Antichrist or, you know, but it's like some everybody wants to pretend like they know his role. So I know Christians who say Trump is probably the Antichrist. And I know Christians who say Trump is this biblical character who's going to be flawed, but save the day because Jesus wants him to. And, you know, I don't really see it either way. I, I, I don't I don't think I should prophesize the bible if i don't really know what's going on because like you know i don't think anybody who thought that trump was that guy in 2017 and 2018 none of them thought that he was going to lock the country down print trillions of dollars sell vaccines and then you know get kicked out of office like that wasn't what anyone was saying you know even i, I remember i debated this guy praying medic he was this QAnon guy um you know i remember he he said basically when when he debated me in like 2018 because i was like how long are you going to do this for because it's like he was like martial law blah 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 and i was like wait you want martial law isn't martial wouldn't martial law be bad and he's like but trump's going to arrest the deep state and i was like all right if you say so but like i was like so when does this end and he told me you know if trump doesn't do if, if trump doesn't do any of this stuff by 2021 i'm done like I, I i could find the interview and show him he was like i'm done if this like I, that's my limit it happened. And I don't know if that guy's still doing it, but there's still the Q decoders doing it. So they, they set these false deadlines and then they're like, I didn't really set it. It's like, so you're just going to do it forever. I'm not, I, I'm just saying like any of the people that were prophesizing that Trump was this biblical hero, none of them thought he was going to be a vaccine, a pharmaceutical salesman doing deals with Bill Gates, like a biblical character who, who does a universal flu vaccine executive order because Bill Gates told him to and offered Bill Gates a position and hires pharmaceutical lobbyists and takes money from Pfizer. Like that's a biblical, like, I mean, it could be, but you know, like, or, like at, at what point do you just admit that you were wrong? Or at what point do you see politics for what it really is? I mean, it, it's almost as dumb as being like, Obama's going to be on my side because he's black. Like, you know, right-wingers will make fun of people who fell for Obama, but it like, the people who fall for Trump are kind of just as dumb. You know, it's like, well, he he must be on our side because because I want him to be. And it's like, OK, maybe hope like and I'm not going to act like his prophecy is set because he, if he wins, he has four more years to, you know, make a huge impact on the country. He's the president. So the first four didn't go as planned uh, or maybe they did go as planned. You know, I'm very thoughtful about it. Like, yeah, I, I have my opinions of what I think, but let's see what happens. Someone said bros making sense. Yeah. It, you know, I, it be, it becomes this thing where the world is so messed up. It's nice to think that there's this guy who's going to ride in on a white horse and save the day. So once you kind of, you know, pin Trump as that guy, then it, it, um, it feels good to just like ride with it.
Let me see. I'm going to try to read some comments. Someone said, I used to watch Rafi and Israel talk about stacking silver, but October 7th really set them off. I just took a break from X. I'm not, I haven't heard who that, I don't know who that is, but yeah, the last, what has it been like six months now? I mean, it's definitely been a cultural shift since that moment. And since Israel's responded, everything's been shifting around that moment. I mean, I talk about it a lot because it's a, it is a pivotal moment. Like the, the war going on, not only is it huge in the Middle East, but, and with America, our foreign allies, Ukraine, like it, it's, it's all, it's not just foreign policy and like physically important. Like, okay, there's war, people are dying. It is really important, obviously. But like the whole way that America operates is, is really kind of related to it as well. Like I'm saying with the colleges, university stuff, I'm not being hateful and I'm not saying they have no right to do it. Your money, you get to do what you want. But most people, when they analyze the college donors, they keep saying they're learning that the left is, is bad. Sort of, but they're really what it is, is they can't use the left anymore as a vehicle for their agenda. So now they're going to use the right. You know, they, they don't feel that Biden's doing a sufficient enough job to push their vehicle and their agenda. So they're going to use Trump. That's what's going on. It would be like saying Pfizer had a, had an awakening because they donated to Donald Trump. Like Pfizer's based in red pilled. They're not based in red pilled. They're blue and red pilled because they donate to both sides and then try to get the outcome that they want, regardless of who is in office. That's a, what a smart billionaire does. A smart billionaire doesn't just play one side. If you have the options to 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 get win, no matter who wins, that's important. And there's entire lobbying groups and donor uh, groups that are that are dedicated to that cause. But apparently in America, people can't figure this out. You know, the right will call it hate speech. The left just doesn't want to hear it. It's fascinating to me because it's so obvious. But, you know, I don't listen to uh, most podcasts anymore. I mean, there's some people that are interesting or like a certain moment will be interesting, you know, to me like, oh, that's an interesting interview or whatever. But in general, most people, their, their, their analysis is just so bad. It's like, oh, the donor meeting. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. That's awesome. He raised a lot of money. Cool. Are you going to talk about who's there or like what, what it might mean or no? We're just going to cheer for don't like, yeah, Trump raised $500 million. Awesome. Great. But like who's, you know, last time he raised a lot of money and ended up selling his cabinet out. So are we going to like talk about that or not? <laughs> you know, it's like, I just can't, I, I, nothing, nobody's that interesting to me anymore. Twitter's interesting because it's got everybody's opinion there. And there's some people I follow I like, but as far as like, you know, like normie podcasts I used to listen to, I can't listen to them. With that being said, I don't know if it's going to change, but uh, Dave Smith, if you guys know who Dave Smith is, libertarian comedian, big podcaster, he's going to come on my show on Wednesday. I'm excited about that. Uh, it's been years we've been trying to like connect. It's never come through. I reached out recently and he's going to come on the show. So that should be an interesting discussion. I think Dave is a really honest guy and he's and he's always got an interesting opinion about everything. And he's always been really reasonable he's never dunked on people when they were getting canceled he's always just been super authentic so i'm excited to talk to him because in this game there's not a lot of people i really even care to talk to but dave has always been one that i felt like is long overdue yeah he's a good guy you know he's he happens to be jewish and uh you know he's getting called anti-semitic all the time on twitter because he's american and just taking an honest reasonable stance as somebody that has a brain so it's like he's he's an interesting guy to talk to for many reasons but it's just interesting that so many people are now calling him anti-semitic all the time when he is jewish and he's just like talking about what's going on i understand tensions are high there's war like i get it i i don't not like uh, i get that's why i don't want to like piss people off like i get everybody's mad right now like ah there's war but like just because you're mad doesn't mean you're right. And like, if, if you call everybody anti-Semitic and everything's blood libel, like, you know, you're going to lose a lot of public support, which is happening. So, you know, even Biden's trying to like distance himself. Like if you lost Joe Biden, like you, that's, that's not a good sign. Does, does he care about anything? I haven't heard Joe Biden say a single thing ever, like on any topic. <laughs> like it's crazy. Uh, Ariel said, thanks for hanging out. Of course. Appreciate you guys. Um, someone said Trump's going to pick Tulsi. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, 
the vice president is more important than ever because Trump is so old. I think he'll be fine. I think he'll probably live till he's like 99 or 100. But Trump is no spring chicken. So, you know, you got to consider that as, as a president. I like Tulsi in many ways, but I don't think it's a good idea to pick a uh, Democrat, uh, uh, you know, a, Dem a vice chair of the DNC. Like, that's what she was. She was the vice chair of the DNC just a couple years ago. Like, I like Tulsi. Um, I would not pick her as vice president. Put her in your cabinet. Tell her you'll give her a position. I'm all for Trump giving Vivek a position, giving Tulsi a position, giving RFK a position. They all deserve a position in the government. But vice president, uh-uh, in my opinion. Someone said Joe Biden's number one issue is Ukraine. It's his pet project since he was VP. It seems that way. It, de it definitely seems like he's all in in Ukraine for sure. I don't think you're wrong there. Someone said Trump will pick someone who voted to impeach him. Someone said, so you're four years ahead again. I'm not four years ahead on, on the reality of it. I'm just four years ahead of the reporting of it because most people are either fake or dumb. Like at this point, so many of these things, it's not like I like found it out myself and was like, I discovered this four years ahead of time. It's happening. Just no one reports on it. Like Ted Cruz was for vaccination segregation and not a single Republican has asked him a question. Turning point puts him on a stage and acts like he's Mick Jagger. Like, I don't know why these people are doing these things. It's so weird to me. And then I say something and they're like, oh, you're just jealous of Charlie Kirk. I'm jealous because I didn't put Ted Cruz on a stage and treat him like Mick Jagger. No, maybe I'm an American who's concerned with the fact that he was pro-vaccination segregation and special rights for the vaccinated, and I want someone to ask him a question about it. Is that fair? Like, <laughs> that's jealousy? That's not jealousy. That's just like, even with Vivek, like, you know, the one thing that I wish I could, if I could have changed anything, is I wish I would have had more time because I could have had a totally different energy. And I even read some of the comments, like, I, I don't always care about the comments that much, but it's like, some people are like, oh, you're rude, this and that. I asked him one question. By the time he stalled for five minutes while we were setting up the interview, by the time the intro came and I asked him one question and he talked in circles for at least one to four minutes, I had 10 minutes to ask eight questions. So I had two out options. Either, either I let him talk in circles and didn't interrupt him and didn't sound rude and talk about nothing for, and then he dodged out of it, which is game theory, what I think he was trying to do. Or I had to rush and be rude and get all my questions out to as even if people didn't like me as the outcome of that interview, at least they would get to see what I wanted them to see, whether they liked it or agreed with them or not. So, it, you know, I, I wish I would have had more time with Vivek. But the whole reason I even requested that interview is because I kept watching other interviews and nobody was doing a good job. I saw Candace and DC Drano interview him and DC Drano doesn't like him. And DC said to him, like, and Candace said, you know, this was in your book about Stacey Abrams. And, uh, you know, Vivek said, did you read the book? And they both said no. And then Vivek said, well, there you go. And then they moved on. I did read the book. I did read the chapter. So he he he, he weaseled his way out of it, but he, he it, it wasn't satire. Like it was all oh, the, the, you know, he was trying to trick the audience into thinking it was just all satire and he didn't really say that. No, the whole chapter was literally about that. It wasn't all satire. So like, that's why I wanted to do the interview. Cause I watched other people trying to grill him, And, you know, I just felt like they, they, they weren't doing a great job to be honest. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't, at least it, it, I just was, I was like, I, I could do a better job. And then I did. It's just, that's, that's the, it's the whole reason I did that. It has nothing to do with jealousy. It's just like, this pharmaceutical billionaire comes out of nowhere after COVID and, and people want him to be the president or the vice president. I'm the crazy one. Like, I'm not saying he can't have a role in the Republican Party, but the last person I want a as a president or a vice president is a pharmaceutical CEO after Trump just sold the country out to the pharmaceutical industry. Like, that's the last thing I want. Um, yeah, I don't, <laughs> you know, I understand it's... um misconstrued sometimes but i i yeah i don't think that that's a small topic to, to just brush under the rug but i you know i, I i've talked about this in other episodes I, I don't think i've mentioned it in a while i believe there's a lot of people who go where the money is look at every athlete what are they selling Whoever pays them. I mean, Shaq is a good example. The dude, the guy will sell anything. 
Shaq is on this, Icy Hot, this commercial, this fast food. Shaquille, there's not a brand that Shaquille O'Neal won't sell. He would sell he would sell salt to a snail and water to a whale. The dude could sell anything. Um, with that being said, it's like that's how a lot of people operate. I I don't personally, but especially with what I do, but I, I've never really been that guy. And I guess that that's rare. Like even as a professional athlete, like you got to sell insurance and stuff. You, you can't you can't find a better brand to sell or make your own. You know, that's the problem with America is everyone's lazy and everybody's a sellout. It's like, yeah, you could sell Subway sandwiches and State Farm. Or since you already have $100 million, you can make your own brand of healthy water and actually like fix the country instead of selling them shit in pharmaceuticals. But most of these athletes don't give a shit because it's like, well, I have a hundred million, but if I sold this, I could have a billion. Or if I sold this, I can have 400 million and it's easy. You know, everybody does what's easy and unethical. And that's the problem in this country. So with that being said, you know, it's the same thing in politics. People go where the money's at. The shifting point for a lot of people, and I'm not saying everyone because I don't know who people are. I just have my opinions. Um, once Joe Rogan made $250 million or whatever he made from a Spotify deal, you best believe a lot of media people were like, what? Before Joe Rogan made that much money, where was the money in politics? Before Daily Wire made any money, where was the money in politics? Fox News, CBS, ABC. These people get a couple million dollars a year or five, 10 million, 15 million dollars a year. I don't know what they get paid. That's where the money is. But if Joe Rogan could make 10 times that and do less and have his own freedom, what? I want freedom. I want that money. And then all of a sudden, everybody starts pretending to be conservative and patriots. And now they're, they're now they're, they're they made a billion off the pharmaceutical industry. Now they're ultra MAGA. But a couple months ago, they said they were crying on January 6th. Like, people don't see this, you know, it's not to say you're a bad person, but the opportunists and the grifters are coming out of every industry hedge fund. You know, Vivek was in hedge fund. Then he was a pharmaceutical CEO. Then he cried on January 6th. And then it's a democracy. Then it's a Republic. And it's a this, and he's a, you know, it's like a it's Trump, Stacey Abrams. Wait, no, he's not. I believe in election fraud. Now, like, you know, it is what it is, but I just see it as they realize that there's money to be made in this industry now. And, you know, I, I somewhat take it personally when people try to just run all over me because it's like what they're planning to do and out of survival for my own career, what they're planning to is why I speak out is sometimes I'm a little ballsy or arrogant about it is they're like, oh, that's where the money is. I'm going to tell the, but they're not really concerned with the truth. That's why they're just going to scam you again. So it's like they're all flocking to this industry to suck up all the money and they are sucking up all the money. There's people that weren't here three years ago that are making hundreds of millions of dollars and they're not reporting the truth. And they're, they're just, they're like the right wing version of the view, or they're just doing just enough to make you like them. How do you make Trump supporters like somebody just say Trump's not that bad or Trump's a good president or MAGA and, and they'll like you. So, you know, there's a rearranging of the, of, of, of the opportunists now because there's a lot of money to be made in podcasting, you know, independent podcasts that, uh, you know, get millions of views are making more money than CNN and Fox News, maybe not the corporation, but individual people. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I see that as the reason a lot of people are coming over and I don't necessarily trust them because if you're only coming for the money, then you'll leave just as quick as you came, you know, because like I can't speak on everyone else's story because I know some people like, uh, you know, I had Clint on my show, Clint Russell, and he said he started talking out in 2020 because of the pandemic and it was so crazy nothing wrong with that that's a total normal time to speak out like 2020 some people have been talking for 20 years some people have been in the game for a while some people they just you know figured it out during the pandemic but at the end of the day like for me my career of pursuing truth didn't start in 2016 when i started talking about politics it started in 2008 when i was rapping i had record deals that i've talked about you know I don't even, I haven't even mentioned this before and I'm not saying this to be cocky. I'm just being, I'm just being honest and I'm not even going to say the name cause I'm not going to try to name drop like that right now. But, uh, you know, one of the biggest rappers in the world and, and it's not Kanye, I know people are going to say that, but, uh, one of the biggest rappers in the world who had the number one song of the year for almost like the whole year, you know, they've DM'd me when they were young saying, I'm a fan of your music. I'm a fan of your rhyme schemes. I love your music videos. Like I'm even influential in the rap world. People don't even know it, but you know, one of the biggest rappers in the whole world right now was a fan of mine when they were starting to be a songwriter and they, you know, liked my rhyme schemes and how I put together my, my, my flow and stuff. And I have 
you know, DMs from like a long time ago. I totally forgot about it, but I was like, oh man, that's crazy. I, for I forgot that we had chatted like 15 years ago about that. But uh, in general, my career, I'm not going to say ended, but because it didn't, it didn't end. But, you know, when it came to major labels, I had deals in 2009, 2010. Do this, do this, do this, talk about this. I didn't want to do it. Door closed. Okay, 2016, I talk about politics. Okay, I start making a name for myself. 2019, Republicans closed the door. Okay, now it's 10 years later, 15 years later, everyone's coming here just because there's money here. And it's fine if you're honest, make money. Like it's not a gatekeeping thing that I'm doing. I'm just saying like the reason I got here is because I sacrificed 10, 15 years of my life to not make money, to do what I thought was right. And now doing what's right is profitable. Other people made a fortune in the pharmaceutical industry, made a fortune in head funds or, you know, weird insurance schemes or whatever. Some of the most unethical companies in the world, unethical business models in the world. And then it's like, oh, Joe Rogan made $250 million. Oh, CNN sucks. Let me be the new CNN. Let me be the new MSNBC. Let me try to make that Joe Rogan money. It is what it is. I'm just saying I don't have to trust everybody, you know, especially when they show me what they're about and who they are. It's not that I'm hating and I want all it for myself. I'm just saying like, I don't trust somebody who only pretends to do truth or content when truth or content makes money. I tend to trust people who did it when it didn't make money because that shows that you're not willing to sell out. Before people even knew who I was in politics, I had almost a whole decade of not selling out and nobody know who, knowing who I was because I didn't sell out and I didn't sign a deal. And then I made it on my own. And then it's like, nobody wants to take those sacrifices, but they're like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah, but okay, you can. But why not do it for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons? You know, there's there's some people who do it for the right reasons. There's some people who ha have an awakening and there's others who don't. On the same topic, it's a different industry, but I find it moderately interesting. Michael Knowles interviewed some OnlyFans chick who said she came to Christ. And now there's this big discussion over whether she came to Christ or not or blah, blah, blah. I don't know the chick and I didn't look into it, but it's like if her OnlyFans is still open, she's just trying to make money off of Republicans. If she closed her OnlyFans and she came to Christ, anybody could come to Christ. I, I believe her more. But it's like if the OnlyFans is still open, then I don't believe that the awakening is real. I believe it's just a scheme to make money off of Republicans that want to look at her naked. So it's like, th this is just how I think. I'm not saying everyone else has to think that way, where it's like little hints along the way kind of give me hints of whether people actually care or, or they're just trying to make a dollar, <laughs> you know? So with me, it's like, it's not a hater sort of thing, but it's like, if you, you know, if you don't want me to say this, this, and this, and people are telling me that I'm getting blacklisted for saying this, I'm like, oh, okay. It's not about, it's not about the content. It's about the money and power. And a lot of the reasons they're doing that is because there's a lot of donor money. Even certain media companies have donors, you know, obviously like a turning point USA has donors and you know, they're connected to politics. It is what it is. I'm just saying like people think that everything's organic. If I had a donor that paid me $20 million and they paid me $20 million for a certain foreign policy, you might think that it's my exact foreign policy. And there's a chance that it might be my foreign policy, but there's also a chance that I know that that $20 million is, is, is attached to that thought of mine or that idea that I might not even agree with. And the second that I stop agreeing with that idea, I don't get the money. That's what a lot of people are doing in this industry. You know, um, I'm going to read this super chat. And then I want to, someone said Mark Dice is great. I want to say an interesting story about that because it's, uh, it's really relevant. Daniel Weird said, true conservatives are getting lower in numbers. Our right wing party gave out socialist checks, believe in bigger government and elected the father of the vaccine. That's three strikes. Excuse my language. Um, yeah, I excuse your language. I hear you. It's definitely... It depends what social media you're on. Sometimes I'm really optimistic. Other times I just like cringe. So, you know, if you're looking on certain social media, you're like, oh, everyone's waking up. And then other social media, you're like, ah, oh, not so much. But um, yeah, I want to talk about Mark Dice for a second, because when the Daily Wire Crowder situation was going on, I'll recap it for those who don't know. Uh, Crowder came out and said, Daily Wire is big con, big conservatives, and they're corrupt. And the reason he was giving was because he got this massive 60 million, 100 something million dollar contract. I mean, Jeremy said it was more, or there were options, or we, they countered. But anyway, it was like, this is how you get the money, and, and this is where it comes from, or what you have to do for the money. And Crowder said, 
your big con. And a lot of people jumped on Crowder's side because it's like Daily Wire is big con. So they're like, yeah, Crowder's ethical. I didn't even like Daily Wire, but I told people I'm not a fan of Daily Wire. But at that time, Jeremy Boring wasn't actually lying, even though I think he's lying now. I, he wasn't wrong where like Crowder, it's like if you want $60 million, you're going to have to give Daily Wire certain rights to certain stuff for them to justify paying you the money. If you don't want their money, then you could do it on your own and own 100% of it. But there's going to be a trade-off. Like Crowder was lying and Daily Wire wasn't necessarily wrong. And that wasn't why Daily Wire was big con. When I took that take, almost nobody had that take, but Mark Dice had the same take as me. And he said in his video, I just reshared it to my Twitter page. This was over a year and a half ago before the Candace Owens situation. He said, Crowder isn't saying why Daily Wire is big con and why Crowder's also big con and what big con really is and what you can't do. And what, what Mark Dice said is, he said, I didn't take a trip to Israel so I could say this, that you're not allowed to criticize the war in Israel and what's going on with the Palestinians or else you get axed from big conservative media. And that's what big con really is. That's what Mark Dice said two years before the Candace Owens thing. And people are like, wow, he was prophetic. He's not prophetic. He's just being honest because that's what it always was. So when Steven Crowder says, oh, they're big con because they offered me this contract, Steven's lying. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that contract besides the fact that Steven didn't want to sign it and he could have got more money and better you know, negotiation out of it. But he's basically creating this side drama over a topic that he's also in on that he never talks about. So it's like, you know, like, how did Mark Dice know before Candace Owens got fired that that was the line? How did I know and tell to PBD that's why Daily Wire would never hire me? How did I know it in 20? Because it's the truth, you know, like the Crowder thing. And people got so mad at me during that because they're like, Daily Wire sucks. I'm not saying they're amazing. I'm just saying what Crowder's saying with the contract and, and, and what he's trying to make it about isn't really what's going on. And I was probably in the minority of people who felt that way. Everyone else was just picking a side and yelling at each other. But I found that video of, of uh, Mark Dice. If you go to my Twitter, you should check it out because it aged really well. Because like, you know, it's like everything he's saying is exactly what happened with Candace. Did he know? No, it, it is what it is. That's the, I said the same thing in my videos without even hearing Mark Dice's take because it's literally the truth. <laughs> like that's the line you can't cross. I told Patrick Bet David in the car when I hung out with him a year ago when he was thinking about I said, Daily Wire would never hire me. He goes, why? I don't know if I got into specifics because I wasn't trying to freak him out, but I was like, I disagree with these speech laws and we diff we have different foreign policy and that's what the Daily Wire cares about. You can't really work there if, if you talk about that. And for years, Candace Owens didn't really talk about it and none of their guests talked. Once she started talking about it, yeah, she went hard in the paint. Yeah, she did a lot more, but that's really the line that everyone knows that you don't cross. And what Mark said about uh, you know, the trip you know, a lot of people take trips to Israel. I have no problem with it, but I think they offer people certain trips to, to like go there and meet with the government. In fact, if you want me to be honest, that trip was offered to me and I declined it. And it's not no hard feelings, no anything. And I'm not going to say because it's not important, but, you know, two of the biggest Instagrammers, one of the biggest right wing Instagrammers was like, yo, do you want to go to Israel? Do you want to take a trip to Israel and meet with the Knesset, which is their Congress? And I was like, no, thank you, because I just thought to myself, I don't want to be involved in a foreign country's government. Like I did want to go to Israel, but I wanted to go on my own and just be a tourist. Like when I go to Europe or Asia, like, you know, I don't or Australia, to be honest, I'm not trying to meet with the government. Like I'm not trying to go on a government official trip. I'd rather just be a tourist, see the place, be a normal person and not get involved in, in foreign policy. Um, that's so I said no. But that it was like. The trip consisted of two of the biggest Instagram right wingers who mysteriously were wrong about the Ukraine war for two weeks and pushing war propaganda. Um, you know, someone who's now in Congress, but at the time they were just an influencer. Like I never took a trip there, you know, but that's why Mark Dice said in that video, he's like, I could say this because I never took the trip. It's true. They offer people trips there to meet with the government. Like, and then Bobby Lee had also mentioned on Joe Rogan's that he took a trip there he thought he was just going on vacation, but they, they, they made him like tweet government stuff every day in order to be there. So I don't know. To me, I was just like, it was no disrespect. Cause I was like, I did want to go there. I do want to check it out and like be a tourist, but I don't want to meet with governments. Like that's kind of, 
you know, I'll go to Trump's White House because I'm American and, you know, that's a cool opportunity. It's just like a little party or whatever. But uh, when it comes to like meeting with other governments, like, nah, I'm not a politician. I'm not, I'm trying to be a news analyst in America. Just say the truth and keep it moving. That's it. You know, it's not like, I, I, I even at the time, I thought that that was, even though I wanted to go there, I was like, I'd rather go by myself unaffiliated. But yeah, check out that clip on my Twitter. Mark Dice mentioned that. Someone said, I live in progressive Portland or, or Oregon. Antifa was brought in. Nothing is organic. It's hard to tell with social media too because like Antifa will do something in one place and then people will film it and it'll look huge, but it's not even that big, you know, but it looks big because of social media. Like I've been at, I've been at protests where like I'm just peacefully enjoying myself, like doing a protest and then I leave and then I go online and like a fight broke out or something. And it's like, I don't live in the reality that everyone lives in. It's like, how did you get in a fight? Like, I don't know. Some people are looking for trouble or like this guy did this. And it's like, when I go to protest, I'm absolutely not looking to fight with people. And it's like, I don't want to fly to Portland to yell at Antifa. It's just like, it just all sounds bad, but it's whatever. Uh, I want to read this real quick. Nisi said, Hey, anomaly, check out Katie Faust on IV IVF. It's an awful industry and I'm mind blown. Any Christian or conservative would support it. Like these politicians are doing pro-life folks are against it. Yeah. The, I, that's why I didn't want to talk on IVF cause I don't know, but my instinct tells me it's a shady, weird industry that I don't support. What is it like in vitro is when you have a kid and another person or something. I, I, I understand that it's like a ne necessity, I guess for certain people or whatever, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't want to really speak on it because I can't like, I don't know enough. I'll look into it though, for sure. Someone said, stop judging people who get IVF. It's not Christian to do so. I, I'm not judging people who got it. I read a comment and I don't think necessarily that that person was judging. I think they were just saying to check out, uh, to research a video about it or whatever. I mean, also you got to like, think it's like the medical industry. It's like, just because you like going to your doctor's office doesn't mean someone hates you for pointing out the corruption in the medical industry. You know, I wouldn't take it personally. Someone said, if you care about truth, you certainly wouldn't go to the Trump white house. No world leader in history has lied as much as he, well, I'm trying to think when I went, I think it was in 2018. I think I went, um, I liked him at the time. I did it. it I'm not lobbyable though. It's not like I go and it changes who I am. Like I'm not that easy to trick or whatever. So it was a Hispanic coalition or something. I went, ate a bunch of Spanish food, never got a one-on-one -on -one with Trump. He just spoke and stuff. I wasn't even that close, but there were probably like 200 people there. I was just drinking a little bit, eating fired Spanish food and talking to people. It wasn't, it wasn't really that crazy. Um, so I mean, at the time, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it because I really like Trump. But as far as like, I can't go there if I, you can think, think what you want, but I did go. So it's whatever. It was fire. Definitely like a cool experience. But, you know, timing is everything. Like at the time, it made sense for me. Now it, it wouldn't. So, you know, is what it is. All right, I'm going to read a few more, then I'm going to take off. We'll keep it under two hours. Uh, someone said, all babies are faked. They're government spies. That, I do not co-sign that theory. I, I do not believe all babies are spies. I hope you're joking. If not, God, God help <laughs> whatever's going on there. I mean, listen, everybody's got a theory, but I, I don't know about every baby's a spy. That's a little too far for me, personally. <laughs> but if that appeals to anybody, I don't know. <laughs> every baby's a spy. You're like, every one of them? There's no real natural babies out here? That's it's a scary world to live in. Oh, baby birds, you're saying? I mean, also, are you, are you on that all birds are spies theory? Because that one's kind of funny to me. I don't know if that's real. Anyway, I think... When stuff like this comes up, you know it's time to like just keep it moving. So anyway, appreciate you guys. God bless you. God bless your family. God bless America. God bless the world. 
Let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for being here today, and hopefully you enjoyed the show I did. Wednesday, if all goes according to plan, Dave Smith is going to be on my show. I'm excited to talk to him. It's been years since uh, I've been trying to connect with him. Hold on. I'm about to sneeze. Oh, my gosh. Hold on. False alarm, folks. False alarm. But uh, it's been years I've been wanting to talk to Dave because I always – you know, I never, I, I've heard him on, on Rogan a few times. I've heard his own takes, but I've always, I've always just thought like Dave seems like a, an honest guy. I'll ask him about foreign policy, what he thinks here. And, uh, just what's been going on the last couple of weeks for him should be a great interview. I'm stoked for it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a long time in the making. We've been trying to connect for like years now. It just never happened. So Wednesday, I think it's 12 o'clock Pacific time. Three o'clock Eastern time. It should be a Dave Smith rare anomaly interview slash conversation. Cause Dave, I uh yeah, I don't have any crazy questions for him. I, I he's he's always on point when I hear him. So it's just gonna be really like a podcast discussion. Appreciate you guys. Have a beautiful day and uh let me know in the comments how you're feeling. Hey, what's going on, my friends? Just a few ways to stay in touch and support if you'd like to. The first way is dreamrare.com. We have blue beanies, black beanies, pink hats, other colored hats, freedom versus tyranny shirts, stay blessed long sleeve, God is great long sleeve, and lots of more cool items coming soon. Dreamrare.com. Check out the shop to support. Everything's made in the United States. Handpicked by me. Patreon.com slash rare talk for $5 a month. You can help support me. Support the show. If you haven't noticed, unlike other channels, I don't work with very many sponsors, sometimes none at all. And part of the way I'm able to do that is with the dreamrare.com shop and patreon.com slash rare talk. So thank you guys for keeping the show free, unimpeded, uninterrupted,